Yeah, they they've been talking to my wife and I for two weeks to take this leg off because no antibiotics, nothing would cure it, and it would just uh, it would, it would kill me. So they had wanted to cut it off to get the infection out of my body. I fought it, and then uh, on a Wednesday they finally convinced my wife and I to do it. So the next morning, I woke up with anticipation and. The first one of the doctors came in and said, they're not going to do the surgery, you're going home today. And I said, well, what happened? And, uh, and then another one came in, and none of them knew why the doctor who was going to cut my leg off decided not to. Welcome to all new episode of Incredible Stories, uh, where we talk about your path of life. Uh, and today, uh, my new guest is Pastor Dominic Thoman. Welcome, yes. welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And uh, we are actually located in the Brooks uh, Church, uh, Christian Church, exactly. Yep. Uh, I found out about this church through the friend of mine, Bob. Bob Marx is already uh, on the show. You guys have a chance to look at it maybe later. Uh, his path of life was also very intriguing. Uh, but today we're talking with a pastor, Dominic, uh, who have been with this church for how long? About 10 years now. 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And your story goes that you actually have started uh, this church uh, from scratch, right? Yes, it was closed for 12 years and... The carpet in here was black. It was a red carpet, but it turned black because it mm -hmm. sat here for so long. And uh, we had two bathrooms outside, so we didn't have no running water. So we really updated the building, and mm -hmm. it's been a real blessing. Uh, I didn't think I'd get this church going, but it's taken off now. So yeah. praise God for that. Yeah, the building, as you can see, uh, it's actually from uh, 1900, 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. It used to be a schoolhouse just out of town here, and they moved it in and made it a congregational church, and now we've made it a non denominational church. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited what God has done here. Yeah. And uh, you can see that this is actually like uh, uh, I moved back in time when I arrived here, like from Old West uh, American Church. Uh, it's, it's really cool. It's really intriguing and it's really nice to be here. And the atmosphere that, uh, well, most of all, you, Pastor, bring in, it's amazing because it, you can feel the Spirit, the Holy Spirit here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. Uh, let's talk about some challenges uh, that you had recently in your life regarding your health. You were diagnosed with? Well, I had a foot infection in my foot because I'm diabetic and... Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't eating for several weeks and just couldn't eat, and then my kidneys shut down, and so I went to the hospital, and they said that uh, I have to go on dialysis, so I'm now on dialysis now, mm -hmm. three days a week, and they said they were going to have to cut my leg off, and so that was pretty drastic, you know, mm -hmm. and I fought it for two weeks in the hospital, but then... Uh, was it for certain that, uh, that they were going to cut it off that was so bad? Yeah, they've they been talking to my wife and I for two weeks to take this leg off because no antibiotics, nothing would cure it, and it would just, uh, it, it would kill me, so they had wanted to cut it off to get the infection out of my body, and I fought it because my grandmother died from the same thing, and I knew they cut hers off, and then they had to cut more of her leg off, and mm -hmm. then she died while I was in college, so... I fought it, and then uh, on a Wednesday, they finally convinced my wife and I to do it. So the next morning, I woke up with anticipation, and the first one of the doctors came in and said, they're not going to do the surgery, you're going home today. And I said, well, what happened? And, uh, and then another one came in, and none of them knew why the doctor who was going to cut my leg off decided not to. Hmm. And 
I felt like I got kicked in the stomach because it's kind of like getting ready for your wedding and then you, you're at your wedding and the bride don't show up. It's like, you should have told me that yesterday. You, know? you, you, were, you were disappointed, actually. I, I was very disappointed, yeah. yeah. I told him I was anticipating it because I had my mental you know, charge up there to yeah. do it. And I said, you weren't anticipating, but what I meant was, you know, I was ready for the challenge because mm -hmm. I knew it'd be a new challenge for me because I'm a guy on the go. So uh, at noon, they finally called this doctor twice, and he still didn't come up to see me. About three o'clock, he finally came in. And, but in the meantime, you know, I was thinking of some Bible verses, lean out on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And I, I didn't want to get bitter at that moment. I, I just wanted to say, okay, God must have had a reason. So uh, actually, I told the, the doctor when he came up, he had two assistants with him. I told him, you know, it was like getting ready for a wedding. And I said, don't ever do this to anybody else because mm -hmm. that was quite a, it was quite a, I don't want to say it, but a drastic, you know, thing that happened, you know, at that moment in my life. But so, make a long story short, I uh, came home and uh, did dialysis, but then I started getting oxygen treatments and a lot of people praying for, for me from here to California, some around the world, and so uh, my foot's all healed up, the infection's all gone, um, there's a little bit bacteria maybe in the bones yet from the blood test, but... Mm -hmm. But I'm starting to walk again on my foot, and it doesn't get red. So I'm anticipating I'm going to keep this foot hmm. for a long time. So it's a miracle here at that little Brooks Church. Yeah, it's definitely a miracle, something that was uh, for certain need, needed to be done. And uh, yet, at, uh, well, the doctor decided not to do it. Yes, and, and the doctors are not so quick uh, to change their mind, right? Right, right, because they spent two hours in my room the day before with every type of doctor, you know, infectious doctors, everybody saying why I had to take it off to preserve my life. Otherwise, I only had two to ten months to live at most. But I'm on my fourth month already, so I feel really good, and I have a lot of energy again. And so I'm back to, to me, normal, except I'm not walking yet, but... I think that's going to happen. So, And you're still going to dialysis uh, three times a week? Three times a week, yeah. I've heard it's a very, very tough experience. It is a tough experience, especially when they take too much fluid off of you. Your whole body cramps up, and then you get like, it's not a headache, but everything kind of turns black. It's because your blood pressure goes way down. Mm -hmm. When they take too much fluid off, your blood pressure drops, and then... Uh, if it goes too low, you know, you'll pass out. So, But it, then it's like the whole rest of the day, you're just out of energy. You can't even sit up and watch TV. It's just tough. Hmm. So I've had a few of those experiences now, but otherwise dialysis is, is okay. It's just when they take too much fluid off. But they can't be God, and so they kind of guess at how much fluid they can take off yeah. of you. Speaking of God right now, uh, would you say uh, the prayers worked? They helped? Definitely, yeah. Prayers really worked in my life anyhow, and I know there's a God. And and I've had other situations with my diabetes that God has helped me through it, and he keeps answering prayer. So, yeah. so praise God for that. Did you have other situations <clears throat> besides uh, health challenges that you could recall right now? Through my life, you mean? Yeah. Well, back in 1990, I I had a successful church, and I wanted to buy a dairy farm and have it to train kids, boys how to do mechanic work and girls how to sew and cook and just to, just show these young people. There are a lot of kids in our city that didn't have farming background or appreciate life and I think that the more you get back to nature the more you appreciate God that you just don't buy food in the store it comes from an animal or a plant and so I wanted these kids to get their hands dirty so um, I was very successful in fact when I was 29 I was voted who's who in America because mm. I started with $1,000 and I had 23 properties that I bought I bought foreclosures and so I got really good deals, and I, I fell in that by accident, kind of. 
And so I sold a bunch of those properties when I was 30 to buy this dairy farm. And I had a few hundred thousand dollars, over $300,000 cash. That was back in 1990, so that was a lot of money back then. Still is today, but a lot more back then. Mm -hmm. And I bought this dairy farm, and the real estate guy said I didn't need to do a title search. So I put the money down, the cash. I was 15000 short. I moved my cows there, so he said the guy was going to put in a land contract. So he set up a land contract. I moved all my cattle there, brought a hired man in. Four weeks later, or three weeks later, my hired man called up and said the bank was there with a bunch of cattle trailers loading all my cows mm -hmm. up. They were all registered, so I had them all in my name, and I would taken them from three other farms. So the bank said they were going to keep the cattle at another farm until they figured out whose cattle they were because this guy still owed the bank $400,000. Mm-hmm. So the realtor wasn't uh, square with me, and um, my uncle told me he was a crooked realtor, and then I found out later that there was like 10 people in front of me that wanted to sue him for bad real estate deals, and it would take two to three years to settle this and maybe get my money back, maybe not. So at that moment in time, I felt like I didn't know what I was doing financially, I stood before the church the next Sunday, and I resigned as the pastor of that church. I started with two families, and they were crying, and I said, I can't preach anymore. I felt like God had pulled the rug out from underneath my feet, and how could he do this to me? Because I was speaking in Christian schools every month in churches, and um, I was voted last the year before, who's who in America, and um, I had a water softener business, I had a successful church, I was running two dairy farms, very busy and felt like I was very successful, but I realized afterwards that I wasn't praying anymore because everything I touched turned to gold, and when I first started that church, I would go to the church every Saturday night and pray for every family there, but I believe the Lord did this to me to get my focus back on the Lord. And so we moved up to Dodgeville, Wisconsin. And I told my wife I was not going to go to church anymore because I felt God had abandoned me. And she said, well, as long as we're married, you're going to go to church. So we mm -hmm. went to church at Dodgeville the first Sunday. The second Sunday, we went to a church over at Boscobel, Wisconsin. And when I went to Bible college... I didn't know what a noun or a verb was. I had to take bonehead English because I was going to drop out of school. This is a part of my testimony. But I did not know what you know, a noun or a verb was. I was going to drop out of school at 16 and just be a dairy farmer. Mm -hmm. But while I was in Bible college, this preacher from Michigan had a country church, about 600 people. And I read his books and his tapes, and he was a speaker the second week over at Boscobel. Mm -hmm. And so here I am, bitter and angry toward God, sitting in the church because my wife said, you got to keep going to church because we have three little children. I want to raise them in the church. She said, you made mistakes. You can't blame this all on God. But as we were uh, singing the invitation that day, I began to tremble and shake and uh, I began to weep and I dropped the hymn book and I went forward and the preacher said, why are you here? And I said, I just quit being a preacher just a few weeks ago and resigned my church, moved up here to Dodgeville. And I said, I need to preach again. I need to preach. And so there was 30, 35 men that took me off to the side of the room there, and we had an hour, hour and a half prayer meeting there. And it was just a tremendous time. But I went back to Dodgeville, and I told the pastor there that I wanted to work with the teenagers, get back into ministry, and... One of the board members said, um, the teenagers won't listen to you. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if this church won't let me preach to the teenagers here, I said, the teenagers are just about gone in this church. They, I could see they didn't have no, no closeness to God. And, and so I said, I'll go in the streets and preach. And then they said, okay, we'll let you do it. Well, we had 40 teenagers come out every Monday night, and we did skits, and I gave them a Bible lesson, preached to them. 
we had one that was called to preach, another one that uh, surrendered to be a missionary, and we had great, great success. Hmm. And so it was great. So this is how we came back to God, came back to this uh, path. Yes. Yeah. One of the guys that I looked up to when I was in college was in that church, and during the invitation, I tried to hold back, but the Spirit just said, you know, I just let go and forgive whatever whatever it took to get back into ministry. And, mm. and so we had a really good time in Dodgeville for a year because I went up there to get away from God and church. And, and you ended up coming back to church. <laughs> and I ended up back in church, yeah. It's like I didn't stay away long. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I did something. And my wife always said, she said, if you commit suicide, because it's kind of suicidal, because I felt like I really failed. Yeah. I felt like I failed everybody. She said, if you commit suicide, I'll never come to your funeral. Because hmm. she says, you have the knowledge, you have the ability. She said, you made some mistakes, you know. And I had a guy from our church in Monroe there, where I, first church I started, he had MS, but he drove all the way up to Dodgeville after I moved out, and he put a tape in my player by Larnell Harris, I Miss My Time With You, and in that song, he says, the Lord never moved away from us, we move away from the Lord. Mm -hmm. We quit praying, we quit reading our Bible, and that was me, and, and he would come out there in the barn when I was milking the cows, and he would stumble in the barn, and he said, you know... You need to get back in the ministry because I've seen such great success with our first church. Many yeah. people coming to the Lord. So uh, I can see now. It seems like your wife played a big role uh, with you know you coming back to church. Yeah, I mean it's important that you find a good wife, you, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, a godly wife. You know, if you find a good wife, you find a good thing, yeah. right? We have this saying in Poland that uh, you know uh, if a man is head of the family, uh, the wife. Is your uh, is the neck of the family yes, because yes. she turns the head. It turns the head. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, tell me how it all started. We know that everything started <coughs> with humble beginnings, mm -hmm. and that was the story with you. You uh, you were raised up in, here in the countryside. Yeah, I was raised on a hundred acre dairy farm with twenty cows, and and when I was five or six already, I would help my dad feed the pigs and. I just loved the cows, and so by the time I was 11, my dad let me take over the herd, and when I was 13, he gave me a dairy cow. He said, I can't pay you, but then I had three other brothers coming up behind me. So then when I was 15, a neighbor bought a 60-cow dairy, and so he said he'd hire me, and so I became his herdsman, actually, and and had great success there, and I made $2 an hour, and and a lot of teenagers don't believe that, but I made $2, and I was happy. And if he told me to run to get a hammer, I ran. I didn't walk. I ran. Mm. And uh, I, was, I was raised to work and felt that work would get you ahead in life. And so I wasn't afraid to get dirty. I enjoyed the cows, and I really studied cows. And, and uh, so when I started little churches like this, I would take over big farms and be their herdsman. And I got paid really well to to support my habit of being a preacher because I wanted to go to these little churches. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that you, I can go to a little church, visit the people, be interested in them, preach the Bible, be you know unapologetic, and God will bring people to salvation. He will change lives, and I've seen that throughout my whole life. And one of the challenges I had was Billy Sunday was a great preacher. He was a ball player. I got saved and had great. He was like a Billy Graham. Yeah. But he came to Wisconsin for three days, and he said it was a graveyard for evangelism. Mm -hmm. But I have seen literally hundreds come to Christ. I've had a lot of baptisms. I've been preaching now for 45 years, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had some amazing transformations, and God is still on the throne and I believe that the average preacher today is afraid to preach from the Bible, and that's why our churches have become weakened and are not effective anymore because the Bible is sharper than two-edged sword, yeah. rightly dividing the soul and the spirit. Amen. Amen to that. Uh, I also had one interview with one other pastor who happened to be my neighbor back in this place where, where I lived. 
uh, Pastor Stephen. Hello to Stephen. Uh, he's going to probably watch it. Mm. And uh, we uh, quoted uh, this definition of faith from Hebrews 11.1. 1. Mm. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. What is your definition of faith, Pastor Dominic? Well, it's uh, trusting God at his word, you know. And he has a lot of promises in the Bible, over 600 that we can claim and we're just, uh, so many times we doubt what God says. And I preached a little bit on giving our first fruits to the Lord. And I was very, very reluctant in giving to the Lord's work. And I don't think it was that I didn't trust God, but I didn't have the faith to trust him, mm -hmm. you know, or, or he might work in somebody else's life, but not my life. And so, uh, I was a penny pitcher, you know, I'd put that penny in the offering plate and Abraham Lincoln would scream when I threw him in there because mm -hmm. I was so tight. <laughs> and I'm in my second year in Bible college and I'm already pastoring a church and I don't know why I'm so miserable. And I got money now in the bank, I saved money, I got a pretty nice car, I got my school bill paid. But it wasn't until I realized what a blessing it is to give to the Lord's ministry or help the poor or just... Give my time to the Lord, and he always replaced that. And so my faith, the def my definition of faith would be taking God's promises throughout the scriptures and just applying them to your life. And the best illustration I have is this guy, he went across Niagara Falls with this little wheelbarrow and a little tightrope, and he went across that Niagara Falls, and everybody applauded him, and then he said, how many of you think I could take a man with the wheelbarrow? Everybody raised their hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then he said, I'm looking for volunteers. <laughs> and all the hands went down <laughs> pretty much. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a good illustration for me because, like, you know, yeah, I believe somebody else could ride in that world, but what about me? Yeah. You know, or, you know, do you I know, trust uh, him? You enough? just reminded me we were interviewing one of the Catholic priests. I come from Catholic background and... And he made uh, this illustration uh, with the example of a man who's uh, hiking, and all of a sudden he he's, he dropped, and he's just barely holding on to a rock. And uh, he screams, "Help! Somebody help!" You know, mm -hmm. and there is no one there. And all of a sudden, this voice from heaven: "If you uh, believe in me, just let go. You know, yeah. my angels will catch you." Yeah. And he's past and is there anybody else <laughs> 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 so this is what mm. you know uh, human faith looks like amen, you know amen. we believe but to a certain point right yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know after i was first married you know the lord laid in my heart that day in the church to give my whole paycheck back and i said lord we got bills due and and so I told my wife, I said, I'm putting the whole check back in the offering plate. And she's like, you know, we got bills. And I said, I understand, but I just feel like God wants us to put it in. And I put it in there. The next week we get our bank statement back and there's, I put like 300, my check back then was $325. And the next week I get my bank statement and we're good for the 600 and some dollars. It was almost like the Lord doubled it, you know, <laughs> and wow. Being a pastor, you have to keep practicing faith. You know, when I first moved up to this area, a farmer gave me a beef, and I don't like soup bones and all that stuff, but I do like T-bone steaks and hamburger. Mm -hmm. So there's a family in need, so I told him I'd give him some, some meat, and so I'm opening up the freezer, and I'm taking out the soup bones and the ribs and stuff, and my wife's like, that's everything that you don't like. Yeah. She said, how would you like if somebody gave you, the, you know, those types of things? And I said, no, I wouldn't. So I put them back. I said, I know. She said, I heard a preacher say once, you know, and I said, oh, I, I, know, I know that guy. <laughs> so I took the steaks out and hamburgers, gave it to this family. The next week, I, a farmer at our church at Douglas, he said, Pastor, could you use some hamburger or some steaks? And I said, yeah, I guess I could. And so our freezer, we took it down a little bit the week before. The next week, it was back full again mm. with the exact same things I gave away. And when I went to Douglas, it was only uh, about five people going there. And we got up to about 20 people. We had about $3,000 now in checking and starting to get a little offerings. And there was a family in a car accident. And I, I told the board, I said, they need heat for the winter. It was like uh, 500 and some dollars it was. 
And they said, Pastor, we're pretty a stringent budget here. And I said, I want to challenge you as a church to learn how to give, how to trust God. And so we gave that $500 to this family. The next week, my treasurer got a letter in the mail at the church there. And it was for $505. We made $5 on the deal, if, mm -hmm. if you look at it that way. But God, God always, and we didn't even know who that family was. And I could tell you story after story mm -hmm. of how God has, you know, my house. We bought my house when we moved up here. Nobody else wanted it. And it was the perfect house that I wanted. It was on 10 acres. And, mm -hmm. and... A lady comes up the driveway the first day we're there. I hadn't moved in my saws and stuff, but I had a guy there by the name of Jeremy working on the plumbing. And he said, I need a three-foot two-by-six or two-by-four. And I said, Jeremy, you're not going to believe this story, but I said, just an hour ago, a lady drove up this driveway to give me a three-foot board as a two-by-six. And I didn't know if it was a joke. I didn't know. Wow. I didn't know this lady. I couldn't find her today if I, you know, it would rack my brain. But I took that board in there, and it was exactly right. The water line was exactly level there where you want it level. Hmm. And I said to my wife, God gave us this house. And so we never say this is our house. We say this is God's house. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is uh, God is God of abundance. He's not a God of luck. That's correct. Amen. Correct. Because uh, you could have, uh, uh, you know, very easily you were giving away money, you were trusting in God, and you were getting it all back from unknown sources. Yes. That, was, that was not logical. That was not what your logical mind could come up with. Mm -hmm. I've always said if I believed in luck, I wouldn't have any good luck at all. Yeah. Amen. So it's God that sends the rain. God sends us our blessings. And he bestows them upon us. Yeah. And uh, since uh, God is the God of abundance, and we just have to look outside to look how many uh, blades of grass there is, how many leaves on the trees, uh, there is abundance of everything in the universe, how many stars, how many grains of sand on the beach, uh, there is abundance of everything. <clears throat> and we, in our minds, create abundance of luck mm. instead of abundance of abundance because we believe that there is luck the law of luck in our lives that if i give away i'm gonna miss something and bible teaches our other ways if you give away you actually give more to yourself it's is correct. it true it's true yeah you got to give to get i guess and uh but you know i always tell people if you just give to get that's not a good enough reason you give because god commands us to give he wants us to help out the poor. He wants us to, you know, <clears throat> as a church family, take care of one another. The early church did that. And it seems like when we do those things, God blesses our churches. And, and, you know, I tell a story when I first came to Douglas where uh, this family was in a car accident. We had started with five people in the church, and they didn't have any money. And we were up to about 20 people, and... We had about 3000 now, and <clears throat> they were paying me $100 a month now, so my wages doubled, you know. And, but uh, this family was in an accident, and they needed heat money, and it was $500 to fill their tank. And the board said, oh, we're, we just can't afford that. And I said, I want to challenge you as a board to learn to go above and beyond what we see or think we can do. And so I convinced them to, <clears throat> to fill that tank up. It was $500. And that next week, the, the treasurer of the church picked up the mail, and he called me and said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. And he said, I got a letter from, and he told me the family's name, and I said, I don't know who they are, but he said it's a check for $505. And I said, well, see, God always provides. When he lays something on our hearts, I think that we lose out in a lot of blessings yeah. when we don't act on it. And I've seen it happen so many times where the Lord says, you need to call so-and-so. And I'm like, why? I think they're okay. And, and he lays them on my heart so much that I call them, and here I find out that somebody in their family just died. Mm. And they're like, how did you know when to call me? And I said, well, I didn't know, but the Lord laid you on my heart. And so... I find that we need to be led by the Spirit and 
need to be willing to do the things in the Bible that, you know, challenges us as well because it's pretty, it, it builds your faith as you see the Lord do those little things in your life. Yeah. And you mentioned faith, uh, and uh, with one of our previous episodes, uh, we had a, a nice chat with Pastor Stephen, who happened to be my a neighbor back in this place where I'm from. And uh, we mentioned that uh, we mentioned Hebrews 11:1. 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is your definition of faith? Well, I think my definition of faith is is trusting God's promises in the Bible. There's over 600 promises in the Bible that we can apply to our life and see that God is faithful. And it takes faith to believe a promise in the Bible because we're so human. Mm -hmm. We're all secular to some degree, and so we think we got to do it ourselves. And But God has given us so many promises in the Bible. And I think of this guy on Niagara Falls. You know, he went across the Niagara Falls with a wheelbarrow and a tightrope, and Everybody applauded him, and then he said, Hey, how many of you think that I could take a man in the wheelbarrow across uh, this Niagara Falls? And everybody's hand went up. Yeah, 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 we believe it, we believe it. And then he said, I'm looking for a volunteer. And all of a sudden, plump, all the hands went down. Yeah. And I think that reminds me of my, you know, I used to believe God would do a lot of things, but I never applied it to my life, you know, or challenged myself to trust the Lord do whatever it may be. And so faith is taking God at his word and applying it to your life. I can't apply it to anybody else's life, but I got to apply it to my life because then I see the evidence of God working in my life. And of course, he takes our abilities and uses them for his glory and honor. Because God is working through people. There's no other way. Right, he works through people, and uh, yeah. and we're that vessel. He could have had the rocks do what I do as a preacher, but he could have had the trees cry out, but he ordained me as a pastor to preach the word of God and accept the, the word by faith and, and to teach it to the people, to accept it in their life and apply it to their lives. And uh, I think now, as I look back, my life was so empty without practicing the faithful things in the Bible. I'm just so grateful that I came to know the Lord, and my life has never been the same. And uh, I, would, I would have enjoyed farming, but never would have seen all the blessings. And, you know, I should have wrote a book about all the things the Lord has done, all the little things, the big things. And a lot of them I've forgotten over the years because, you know, we do forget the things that God does yeah. in our life. But That's why we do these interviews, because this is like, we believe that everybody has a book deep inside of them that needs to be written, but there is uh, people have no time, no ability, no mm -hmm. resources. That's why we come up and we record them. We put it on tape and it stays forever uh, on YouTube for the generations. Mm -hmm. That's why we came to you. That's why uh, this is, I believe, this is the story that needs to be told. And uh, it is one of those inspirational stories because uh, what we talked about previously, uh, we talked about uh, what is missing today in America. And uh, I believe, and we both agreed that uh, the spirit of the conservative way is missing today, that we take for granted what we've had today, that this country, like the fathers of America, when they set this uh, country in, they, they didn't believe uh, in the country they believed it in you know so mm -hmm. they uh, they they fa their faith was so strong so they believed the country into existence mm -hmm. you know just like you mentioned before that uh, we could go to mexico we could go as immigrants to any other country but this is about the spirit of the country not about the place right and, you know, there may be other countries with more resources, but because our forefathers, you know, put God first, they built a church first for a, for a barn to milk their cows or built their houses. They made a church first. They wanted to, to have the church setting and have God in their, their country. And, of course, the Lord made this country a great country. And I, I'm just so excited. I grew up in a Christian family. I mean... They weren't born again, but they were Christian anyhow. So we had, you know, the form of going to church and 
They had the values, the old conservative values. Most churches back then had that conservative values, and even the world had that value. Even if you didn't go to church, people, you know, still saw the importance of, of putting God in things and, you know, in a family. But, you know, we'd get around the table. We'd have to pray before we ate food and give God the, the credit for our harvest and our food. So we need to get back to those old-fashioned values where we get back to where we understand where our beginning began and and what made America great. You know, it wasn't smart people. It was, it was the Lord. Yeah. And uh, just like we said before, uh, we are the people and uh, uh, the government is for the people and by the people, right? So we should, uh, the government is our employees it on is. the other way. Right. right. So they work uh, for the people and not the other way around. But this is not a political talk. We talk about the spirit that is uh, today in America and the spirit that is uh, here uh, in this place. Because definitely when I hear you preach, uh, I feel the spirit in this church. Hmm. And it's no wonder that uh, you have great success previously working uh, with uh, teenage kids. Uh, what would you say your message would be today for today's teenage uh, uh, generation? Well, I'd like to have our teenagers learn again what made this country great, what you know, gave us all of the liberties that we have and why we enjoy so much that we enjoy today. I think our children need to go to a third world country and see what they don't have, what we have, and how we've been so spoiled here. And, of course, uh, over in some of these countries, it's just about survival, staying, you know, have enough food and, uh, you know, have shelter. And you know, if there was a big storm, it'd take our, you know, our properties. It comes down to three things: you need need a place to for shelter, yeah. you need water, and you need food. And you know, um, I think our young kids need to learn that again and learn the value of reading the Bible and thanking God for their parents, have a respect for God, to where the Bible says, "Honor your parents with love and respect them." and my parents were old-fashioned, but I thank God that they instilled in us some values. That what was your relationship with your mother and father? Well, I had a pretty good relationship with them, but as I got my teenage years, I got rebellious because, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't a born-again Christian. So, you know, I sang in the choir and did all the things at the church, but I never read my Bible and all those types of things. But my relationship with my parents was... Uh, uh, I really loved my dad, but he was more easygoing. And, and of course, I said when I get to be 18, I was going to leave because I didn't like all their rules. And, of course, they were good rules because they were still fashioned in the Bible. So I appreciate him for that. What did your father talk to you? <clears throat> he taught me how to work hard, um, to try to do a good job. And he taught me... The most important thing in life is to follow God. He said the second thing was to be with your family. Third thing was the farm. And when I got my teenage years, I really I was really gun ho and I wanted my dad to go from 20 cows to 100. And mm -hmm. I said, Dad, we can get bigger tractors and bigger trucks and all these things, combines. And, and my dad said, well... I'm making a good living. He said, if you want to get bigger, he said, you go work for somebody else. He said, I'm going to enjoy going to church. I'm going to enjoy taking my family on vacation every year. I'm going to enjoy I'm going to enjoy my family. And he did. And he made you go on the vacation, too. And he made me go on vacation as well. Yeah, and I just, I just got so mad. But he made me go, and I said, Dad, Betsy is going to get sick maybe when we're gone. He said, I'd rather lose one cow and have memories of my family than to keep a cow and not have any memories with my family. And so, and when I struggled to be a preacher, I remember my, when I went back to school uh, my second year, I, I wasn't going to go back and I rededicated my life to be a preacher August 28th. And, and I was going up the road from our farm and I told my dad, I just, I just don't know if I can do it. 
And he said, son, somebody else will always milk cows. He said, what you do for the Lord is not everybody can do that. And he said, the cows will always be here. Somebody, he said, when you're dead and gone, somebody else will milk them. And he said, what you do for the Lord is the only thing that's going to last eternally. And so that was words of wisdom that I still remember today, you know. Beautiful, beautiful anecdote. And uh, speaking of your parents, what are uh, your relationship with with your kids right now? Yeah, my my kids. I have a relationship with all three of my kids. A good mm -hmm. relationship. You know, Father's Day is coming up in two weeks, and I talked about my dad here last year. He's mm -hmm. got five children. They all go to church, and uh, all their You know, all of his grandkids are in church and great grandkids are in church and it's getting to be like 60 to 80 young people and I say now as my dad looks down he probably really realizes the value of putting God first in a family you know none of my brothers ever end up in alcoholism or drugs or divorced or any of these things I mean it's all because my parents put God first in their family and The farm did very well, and my dad said, I'm not going to work for banks and pay for interest. He said, I'm going to work for the Lord, and I want to serve the Lord. And and so uh, I'm very blessed that I had a dad that had that kind of value, and my mom as well. And see, uh, <clears throat> we're coming back to the roots right now. We're at this point uh, in the history that we have to choose. We're either going to integrate with machines and let them uh, control our bodies or put the chips in our brains and let the artificial intelligence think for us, mm -hmm. or we're going to come back to the nature, let your hands dirty, like you said, and uh, get this connection with nature, with God, with the uh, expression of the spirit that is uh, existing That is right now we are we are on the crossroad right now. We have to choose as mm -hmm. a human race. We have to choose right now because uh, it is coming. It is coming very fast. With uh, right now the advancement of technology. If you think 10, 15, 20 years ago we had no iPhone, and right now we have iPhones and iPads and uh, and all those things that they do virtually everything for us mm -hmm. and uh, today's kids they cannot imagine not having every possible information at their fingertips mm -hmm. and uh, we both know the pre-internet era but they don't and this is why this program is about why we are shooting this information because the people need to pay attention and realize that uh, This might be scary, but out of every adversity, there is seed of greatness. So if this is adversity, there is a greatness on the other side of this adversity, and we have to make this decision right now. Yes, we do, yeah. yeah. And artificial intelligence really scares me because it's just uh, a way the government's going to be able to control us to think the way that they want us to do and takes God out of the equation. Out of the equation. And uh, people say, but I don't want to read the Bible. It's, it's just too hard, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just too complicated. And I don't want to follow the rules. Like mm -hmm. your dad, okay, you, you were rebellious when you were a teen. Every teen is rebellious. But those rules are for your highest good. Mm -hmm. And people yes. don't understand it. Right. Yeah, I used to think I was kind of... In a bad family because I had all the rules. I couldn't do everything my friends did. But then when I went back and then as I became a pastor, all my friends were in jail, prison. And and I, I still remember three of them that I've gone to visit. They have children, but they'll never get to grow up with their children because they're going to spend their life behind bars. And, yeah. and so I thank God more and more every day that my parents were strong enough to discipline us not afraid, and, and when I raised my kids, and oh, my oldest daughter was going to call the cops on me with my youngest daughter, but I wanted my kids to obey me, and I told my oldest daughter, I'd rather sit in jail the rest of my life, you knowing that I loved you guys and wanted to discipline you, than 
to have you guys just let your life go and become whoever you want. And so the funny thing is my oldest daughter calls every day for advice to raise her kids now. Yeah. So best well, of friends. Best of friends, yeah. yeah. Yeah, lovely. What is the message today for people, for humanity, for our listeners? Well, I think I, my message would be is you got to get back into the Bible, respect God again, get back to the old-fashioned values, what makes a good family, um, realize the importance of your time. What you do with your time shows your priority to God as well as to your family. We do what we think is the most important thing at that exact moment. So uh, if you don't go to church, you're maybe making your yard more valuable than God. Um, you know, we all could stay home from church every week. I mean, I could find excuses. But my family, and I told my kids as growing up, my son one Sunday said, I don't want to go to church today. And I said, son, you grew up in the wrong family. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And, and now he knows the Bible so much better than I, and he's doing children's church and turned out to be a good young man, and I'm proud of him. But he he's studying the Bible. He knows all the religions of the world, and and uh, I just wish I was smart as him now. But, mm. but you know, we gotta we got to stand firm as humanity, get back to our values, and Always be willing to fight for what's right and not just bow the knee to Baal or to the devil, you know. Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned that in college you were not genius, that you were actually struggling. <clears throat> I've heard this phrase that God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the cold. Hmm. So it's not about being qualified of having knowledge or being a know-it-all guy. It's about the calling. Hmm. Yes, I, I knew a guy had called me, and I, I questioned the call because I wasn't that smart. Yeah. But yet, you know, as I read the Bible, I saw Hosea, I saw Amos, who was a farmer, who said, Lord, take my life and use it. Isaiah said, Lord, I can't speak, and the Lord said, I'll fill your mouth. And, and so I took that, took that as a challenge and... Then I heard some messages where people said it's yet to see what God could do with somebody that would give their life to him wholeheartedly. And some of these were great preachers who had done a lot of things, and even they said if they wish they would have gave more of their abilities to the Lord. And So I didn't have much to stand on, but I did know that I had the Lord behind me, and, and I took Jude 123 and having compassion making the difference. And as I began to go into ministry, I saw that some of these guys that had more education than me thought God had to use them. And God doesn't have to use any of us. We have to be a vessel willing to be used of the Lord. And, and so I thought, well, maybe I got a chance to be successful as a preacher. I said, I can do Jude 123. I can love people. And before I got saved, I used to like to see people get mad and blow it. I called a head gasket. They get so mad. And uh, I had some teachers swear and cuss at me in school. And I just loved it. It was just, just made me feel happy and make them so mad. But after I got saved, then all of a sudden I had a desire to make people who were losers winners. And so I enjoy buying old houses and fixing them up because you can make such an improvement in the house. But my biggest challenge is to be a pastor, to challenge people to see a change in their life, to encourage them they can do it and with the Lord's help. With houses, I can take a hammer and, and bend the two by four, and if it don't work with a hammer, I can get a sledgehammer, and usually I can move it. Yeah. But with people, I can't use a hammer or a sledgehammer. i got to trust the Lord and the Spirit. And so when I preach, uh, I understand now at this age that I could be the greatest orator. But if I don't have God's blessing, if I don't have his power, if the Spirit's not working, it's dead wood. Uh, it's just words. And so we got to have a, we got to have the Spirit of God work in our life and, and allow the Lord to work our talents in us and trust in him and trust in him yeah you know i like you know proverbs 3 5 and mm -hmm. 6 you know lean out on understanding but in all the ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths and and then he says in proverbs 3 9 you know honor the lord with your substance you know their fruits and 
Uh, we may not have as much. Our settlers that came to America didn't have much, just the clothes in their back, basically. But God blessed them because they put God first. And yeah. And this is that belief in yourself, believe in God's power, because uh, when you start thinking in uh, humanly, in, in, only in your mind, what you can achieve, uh, you start to be really scared, yes. especially when you're a settler, when you're an immigrant from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, when you look, for example, at Chicago or uh, big cities, uh, where there is uh, like uh, two or three or four generations uh, uh, of welfare recipients, you see that kids growing up are, uh, you know, they have examples of parents being welfare recipients and so on and so forth. So why should I go to work? I'm, I'm going to be welfare recipient too. Hmm. And uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, when someone comes to America, uh, just like me, I'm an immigrant from Europe. And this is for us, this is the land of opportunity. So, well, we can do anything here versus mm -hmm. the kid out of college who just finished his, his degree and he says, oh, this is America, I can't do anything here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, for example, in New York, 76% of all uh, new businesses has been established by first-generation uh, immigrants. Wow. So that's uh, how America is perceived. It is perceived as a land of opportunity. But people here, I believe, take it for granted as we talk again and again because they are just, you know, oh, well, I was born here, so what's the big deal? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't have to travel through the ocean or you don't have to mm -hmm. put yourself through the struggle. Like right. me, it took me 16 years to get my citizenship hmm. uh, versus, uh, well, right now people are just crossing uh, uh, border. <laughs> <getting citizenship. laughs> well, that's a whole other story. Yeah. Well, so this is about coming back to the roots, coming back to the originals and what made us strong, what made us uh, mm -hmm. as a country, as a people. And this is number one, trusting in God, your family. Mm -hmm. And then it's... Uh, uh, your farm. <laughs> Number yeah. three is your farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of feel like an immigrant because I was the first Toman to go to college, and, you know, that was a big thing to the family because wow. uh, all my uncles, you know, were farmers and drinkers, and, you know, they all attended a church every Sunday, but they weren't close to the Lord at all. You know, they lived just like the world. And so when I went to Bible college here, they found out I was going to Bible college to be a preacher, so I felt like an immigrant. And then here I am inside, fearful, am I going to even make it, you know? But, you know, the Lord hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. And and uh, I just just see that as an immigrant comes to a country with nothing, sometimes I think we need to stand before the Lord. We have nothing really to offer God. Yes. And we just need to give what we have to Him, and He can take it and make it beautiful and out of our life. And, and so... I still stand back. I'm amazed at what God has done through my life. And the people have come to know the Lord. And, you know, I've pastored now for successful ministries. And, you know, I enjoy it dearly. And Over 45 years? 45 years, yeah. So I didn't think I'd get this church going, but now it's really become a great church. And God has brought people in here. And it just... Uh, it just brings me to tears sometimes to think what God has done and with my life. And I sometimes say, Lord, maybe I wish you'd have made me smarter when I was younger. But, you know, I think if I'd have been any smarter, I would have probably been cocky and, and God would have never used me. And so I'm glad I was born in a family that was just down to the old principles and made us work hard, made us yeah. go to church and probably the best foundation I could have because uh, it's made me who I am today. And, and so I'm thankful. God does not make any mistakes. And as we talked earlier, I've had health problems. You know, I was very healthy until I was 50. And then I had a stroke and that began my diabetes and then a couple heart attacks. And um, I thought, 
I was invincible, but uh, back in 90, I was very successful business-wise and was going to retire at 35 financially by keep preaching, and, and God took that away from me. And so I've gone through all these facets of things, and um, my wife said every time I go through the difficult things, the Lord makes me a better preacher. Hmm. And, you know, I used to say, I, you know, I could relate to people, but now it's a lot easier because, you know, I was there where I thought I was going to file bankruptcy once. Uh, I was there where I wanted to take my life because I thought God had abandoned me. I've been there where my health is so bad that I know a lot of people would pull the plug. But I've seen miraculous miracles happen through all these things. And so when we get a bump in life, and my life didn't go exactly the way I had dreamed, but nobody's life goes the way they dream. So that's why it's so key to let the Lord direct our paths. And I know that he allows things for a reason and a purpose to make us the men or women we need to be. And so I'm grateful that I know the Bible. Without the Bible, without being a Christian, life would be pretty desperate for me anyhow. I would have no hope. But uh, when the doctors told me I had two to ten months to live, it didn't even affect me. And I had a doctor come back later and sat on my couch for, for an hour. I wanted to know why I was so strong and why it didn't affect me. And I said, I already planned for this day, the day that the Lord takes me home. I know where my home is. And... So I got to share my testimony. I actually got to lead a, a, a chaplain to the Lord because she didn't have a testimony. I said, what's your testimony after I shared mine? And she was, I could tell she didn't have it. And she's like, I don't have a testimony. Mm -hmm. And I'm religious, but I don't have a testimony like you got. And then I led her to the Lord and a nurse. And another chaplain came in. She heard my testimony and she wanted to sit down and talk to me and so she said, I'm not supposed to do this, but I, she gave me her number, and, and she wants to stay in contact with me. And uh, she said, you changed my life. And I said, I'm just a farm boy who was called to preach. And hmm. and she said, no. She said, you have changed my life. And that's kind of my title of my, my life is a dairy farmer becomes a preacher. Yeah. Um, Amazing story. Just put yourself in the river of Christ. Yes. I went from blue jeans to suits and... Uh, People that know me as a farmer can't believe I'm a preacher, and people that know me as a preacher can't see me ever milking a cow. But, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. what, I can get dirty, and I can do all those things, and uh, not afraid to get dirty. And we're not afraid to uh, come back to our origins. And uh, today uh, we're going to do very special and unusual thing. We're not going to do a fist bump. We're not going to do any of the chicken thing. We're going to do old-fashioned handshake. Amen. Pastor. God bless you. Thank you very much. God Thanks bless you. you too. Amen. <laughs> 